I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a, and a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Born in Sydney in 1970, Gladys Berejiklian is the eldest of three daughters born to Armenian immigrant parents. Gladys attended North Ryde High School and studied at both the University of Sydney and the University of New South Wales. Famously hard-working, she's held a number of high-profile roles in her political career, culminating in her appointment as leader of the New South Wales Liberal Party and the Premier of New South Wales. And you are a bit of a culture vulture, so I, I gather... <laughs> that you read so much that even as a young girl, they had to ship in books from other schools. Is yeah. that correct well, or I'd, an urban I'd, myth? No, 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 it's true. In sixth class, I'd read every single biography book in our year six wow. library. Mind you, I don't think there were many at the time. Thinking back, there were probably only eight or nine of them, but I'd read every single one. So Mrs. Tasker kindly borrowed um, biography books from other libraries and or like other school libraries. And um, some years later, I bumped into Mrs. Tasker in camera and she'd remembered that she'd oh, did it. So it was lovely. How gorgeous. Because yeah. the, the, the idea of the show, isn't it, it's the favourite, it's a favourite. Exactly. Because it's impossible. Yeah. If you read oh, as yeah, much yeah, as you yeah, do, yeah, you yeah, go, yeah. well, I've, you know, yeah. how can I choose? Well, we're going to start with your film. And you've chosen the film adaptation of the 1959 <laughs> Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. Uh, the film that won five Oscars and took over from Gone with the Wind is the most successful film of all time, and it's The Sound of Music. So I'm in good company. <laughs> <laughs> to, to tell me, tell me uh, the story behind that. It was the first film I watched um, that I fell in love with and wanted to see over and over again. I'm not somebody who likes to see a movie again. So once I see something once, I don't like to do it because there's so much out there. I don't like to waste my time and see something again. But um, as a child, my father was obsessed with that film and made us watch it. And I similarly became obsessed with it. And every time it was on television, before videos and before taping things, um, we made sure as a family, but I, I certainly made sure that I was allowed to watch it. And um, it's interesting because every year that I watched it, I learned or gained something new from it, which is, is I think, what it renewed my love for the film. So whether it was enjoying the music one year or the drama of the World War or the notion of patriotism um, and the romance, there was always something new I picked up. Great music. And great music. As I matured, there was always something new I learned from it. And, um, yeah, it just always stuck with me. So it's obviously based on a true story, the, the Von Trapp yeah. family. And, and I've got a confession, I'm slightly um, embarrassed to oh. admit this, is I wept tears of uh, shame, anger and sadness in reading about the Armenian genocide oh. in researching for this mm. Um, mm. this conversation. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I feel like an earthworm because I, I didn't know, I didn't know yeah. anything about it. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, a lot I'm, of people don't. A lot um, of people don't. Um, and I think that's the thing. We don't learn from history if we don't study our history. Mm. And so my hope is that people are aware of the Armenian genocide, not because it's um, personally impacted my family, but because it makes all of us aware of what can happen when you allow, firstly, hate speech to perpetuate and then actions. And we can't assume we're immune from it in this modern age because we see in, in different parts of the world people getting persecuted for who they are and what they believe in. And uh, that's why I think if we don't learn from our history, we're condemned by, by yeah, it in the future. To, re to repeat mm, it. Mm. And, and so like the 
you know, the real Von Trapps is that narrative of fleeing the Nazis over the mountains would, I imagine, fireside chats for future generations it sort of inform their whole being. It is How does that inform sort of your life and your work? We, you know, your family's involvement in that awful tragedy, and particularly your grandparents, mm. is mm. How, how it was that spoken of or... Uh, it, it wasn't spoken of broadly. It, it would, the actual events were spoken of every year. So as a family, we'd commemorate the Armenian Genocide every year. And and whilst my parents didn't go into a lot of detail about what happened to my grandparents um, and how they experienced it, we certainly spoke of the event and how one and a half million people were impacted. And, and I remember one year I asked my parents, I gave them each an exercise book. I said, Mum and Dad, write down everything you remember. And they each wrote only about a page and a half. So I mm. gave them a 64 page. And we, but it was just what they remembered. And so my dad wrote about how his father used to talk about the little almond garden and, and how they lost, or, or just his perceptions about what he remembered. But it was just oral history, which was lost forever. Um, and my mother just wrote that she was she was told her grandfather and um, her father and, and mother lost 42 members of their extended family. And so that's, you know, obviously that is, um, it's part of my his, my family history. I'm not unique though. Um, and, and unfortunately, Armenians aren't unique. As we know, Hitler said, who then remembers the Armenians when he was contemplating the Holocaust? And um, again, an example of if you, if you don't deal with history, you're condemned to repeat it into the future. Yeah. On a completely different and lighter note, yes. the Armenian. Uh-huh. Is I wrote a book, uh, I've written three, but, but in the middle one, I wrote a book, my wife drives me up the wall because when uh, we leave parties, she says, we're going now, and then about an hour and a half later, we'll actually leave. Right? <laughs> you should be a politician. <laughs> well, 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 here we go. And my mate John said, there's a word for that. He, he's a Greek fellow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he goes, it's called the Armenian farewell. Oh, there and you I go. go. Is yeah. it? We like to talk. Is, 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 is that true? Is, it, is we, that a We like to talk, yeah. And I, and I guess there's an element of, of politeness as well where you're <laughs> grateful to the host. So you say a proper goodbye and yes. You say goodbye in the kitchen, in the corridor, yes, in the heard, garden. I have to confess I'd not heard of that saying. I mean, Greeks and Armenians go back thousands of years so um thankfully john's got john's conveyed that little bit of um yeah nostalgia that i wasn't aware of <laughs> okay we're going to move on to your um book we're going to come 12 years um further on in 1977 and like your film it's based on a true story it's mm-hmm. a historical children's novel by the canadian author eleanor kerr it's uh, sadako and the a thousand paper cranes. cranes Tell yes. me about that. I didn't read that book until year five or year six, so I'm interested. Shipped in from another no, school. No, actually, I think, no, I bought that from Book Club. Do you remember Book Club when you got to, do you remember Book Club where you essentially um, at school they used to give out a sheet of paper and they told you a little bit about each book and then you got to tick it and put money in there and get the book that arrived. So I begged my parents to let me buy a book called, because it the little history, the little thing they'd written about it seemed really interesting, the little ac- extract. And I was in year five or year six, and I've still got it, but I wore it out so much, the front cover's gone and the pages are all shabby. <laughs> but it, it was the first book that I kept rereading, and it was, um, for me, I think it prompted by perhaps my family were always interested in global events and um, the talk of the dinner table wasn't politics, but it was more about the world around us and what was happening. And And the book was all about this young Japanese girl about my age who got cancer because of the impact of the Hiroshima bomb. Yeah, she was Japan. two and a mile yeah. away from the bomb. True story yeah. when, when it landed. And, yeah. and um, it was her life and her way of uh, providing hope was to was to fold a thousand paper cranes. So her friends and everybody um, got involved to try and support her through that. And it was just her own journey and it had a very sad ending and I was obsessed with it and I felt for her, I empathised with her. Um, and I guess at that age, I was starting to come to terms with what does it mean to get sick and what does it mean, you know, what what's human the human condition and mortality all about and how tragic that war had done this. And we don't want war. And I think, you know, for, for us growing up of my generation, Gen X is, you know, the Cold War was so real. And and all of that came together for me. I guess it was my coming of age of sorts, you know, my pre-teens kind of starting to think about the world and what it meant. And, and through this book, I kind of thought about so, those but things. But so sad. So it's it in the sad. story, as it's written, as, as Eleanor, the author, yeah. the Canadian author, writes it, uh, the, the idea was if you made a thousand... In Japanese mythology, you get a wish that's granted, yeah. which is obviously to yeah. live. Yeah. Uh, and she only got to 655, yeah. so she carked it, poor girl. Yeah. Um, but in, in real life, she did get to 1,000. 
I didn't know the real life yeah. story. She, so she's a real lady, wow. and she did get to a thousand. Yeah. She still cocked it, poor girl. Yeah. So they, you know, thank yeah. you for the myth. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But, but they've sent those paper cranes around the world. So they're in different museums around yeah. the world to try yeah. and sort of remind people of the horrors of nuclear war. And it's it's an amazing. I'm, I'm very grateful to you for choosing it because I I wasn't aware of it. Oh, and and I don't know. I have, I haven't read it as an adult. Right. I only read it as a child through a child's perspective. So I'd be interested to see how I react to it if I read it as read it as an adult. But certainly I think what it did for me is just highlight and my personal fears at the time, you know, when you're a young person and you mm. hear about war and nuclear bombs and the Cold War at the time and um and then the vast reality of it. So it did yeah, it touched me at the time. Yeah. Mm. Now, there's a theme in your choices, in your first three choices. Oh, is is there? there? There is. You may well, not. I have, I've not thought I'm about I'm here what's to let thing. you know. Tell me. It could be, <laughs> it could be <laughs> a, a, a very, a, an epiphany might, might awaken me, yes. Well, well, here we go. It, it's You choose uh, pieces of art that are based on true stories. I, and guess what? I don't tend to read a lot of fiction. Well, but, but even your song. So your mm. song, you, you've mm. chosen a, a song from Ed Sheeran's third studio album. Yes. Uh, Everybody loves this song, though. Well, it's perfect. Do you know the story behind it? No. It's absolutely mm. sensational. I like the words to the song, but he, I don't know the story. Rob, well, here we go. Yeah, so, okay. so, so it's based on yep. a, like your book and like yep. your film. Yeah. So Ed Sheeran, in real life. I've met him. I know. I love him. I, we, we, we're coming on to he that. He knows I love him, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a picture, you haven't you? got the old I selfie. I do, I've yeah. got a picture in my office, yep. <laughs> um, in real life, at school, he had a sweetheart who he was in love with mm-hmm. at school, Cherry Seaborn. Mm. So, so his, you know, who did you love at school? Mm-hmm. I love Cherry. Uh, and then they left school and didn't see her for mm-hmm. 10, 11 years. Mm-hmm. Met her again when he, in 2015, when he was a global superstar, mm-hmm. married her. <gasps> yeah, what a story. He is married to Cherry Seymour. I knew that he married his childhood sweetheart, but I didn't realise that story. And wrote that song for her. Wow. So there are women around the world gnashing their teeth, going, why can he have that story? That's you know. an amazing story. But I, th- I think that's why he's such a prolific writer and he understands women and he understands the relationship yeah, yeah, yeah. with men and women and um, I think why is good as he's good at what he does. So, so, so you've ripped the guts out of my next question because okay. I, was, I was hoping you did know that story because yeah. then I was going to ask what I'm going to ask anyway, yes. which given that it's based on Ed's real life story, yeah. is did you choose it because it reminded of you or reminds you of any significant, pivotal, romantic relationship in your life or just because you like the no, tune? Or I, I, I know I like it because... I like what the song represents and I like just the notion of, um, you know, when two people are madly in love, they see perfection in each other when all of us know we're full of imperfections. And I think that's the notion that really interested me about the song, in addition to loving the music about it. Right. Yeah. There's another um, uh, interesting quirk about it is it's the first song that Ed ever collaborated with Matthew, his brother. And the reason he did that was his granny's final wish was to see Matthew and Ed work together before she fell off the perch. Wow. So they did. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. This is why you're a journalist. (laughs) All this interesting insight, it makes my decisions much more informed than what they are. You're so interesting, Gladys. (laughs) (laughs) So so, so that leads me to ask, is... um, Tell me about your sisters, your relationship. How? How? I mean, are you close? Oh, Where do they live? Incredib- we're incredibly close. Um, we like like any siblings. We um, fight all the time, but, but we're inc- incredibly close and very honest with each other. I mean, I'm lucky that I've got very close friends. Um, but even with your bestest friends, you tend not to want to hurt their feelings, and you can't always be very brutal. My sisters and I are brutal with each other, <laughs> uh, which is good and bad, um, but we, we're extremely close. And, and are they in Sydney? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'm lucky. They We all live within a few kilometres of each other. So, oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, so we're kind of in, in each other's lives and don't live too far from my parents who are elderly. Um, so it's lovely. your place you've chosen Northbridge mm-hmm. 
Uh, and I've been reading lots and lots and lots about Northbridge. What a little slice of heaven it is. Near it to is. the city, near to nature, parks, golf courses. I've got kookaburras courses. in my backyard and goannas. Well, not goannas, but large lizards, yeah. yeah. So, so, so tell me the story. Why did you choose um, oh, Northbridge? I, like, I chose Northbridge only because that's where my home is. I think... Uh, I think everybody's home is their favourite place. And for me, it's my sanctuary and, and it's my escape. And um, I feel very lucky to be living where I do. It's very convenient, but also I do feel close to nature. And when I'm close to nature, I feel most relaxed. And I just love having kookaburras and animals in my running around in my backyard. And by the same token, if I jump on the bus, I'm in the city within five minutes or seven minutes. So I feel extremely grateful for where I live and um, and home home is where the heart is and that's certainly how I feel. Because can you ever imagine living anywhere else? I can't imagine living anywhere outside of Sydney, no. no. Sydney's no. always been my home and um, and uh, I haven't moved very often in my life. I'm someone, I'm very lucky. I've had a very stable childhood. My parents bought the family home when I was four and I stayed there till I was 29. <laughs> so... For a quarter of a century, I lived in the same house and my parents are still there and I go and visit them every Saturday afternoon. And, and do they live in Northbridge as well? No, no they live in North Ride, which right. is where I grew okay. up. But, but it's only literally 10 or 15 minutes away down so, the road. So yeah. One of the things I love about Northbridge is the sort of the Harry Potter-esque bridge that you, you yeah. go across from Camaray to get there. It's yeah. gorgeous. And that, that was built in 1892. So someone had the foresight to build a bridge that you and I drive over in 2019. You go, respect. Um, would you mind talking a little bit about the importance of people who've got a long-term vision? You know, you know infrastructure that's going to last 130 yeah. years, like the Harbour Bridge, like the, you know, it's wonderful. Yeah, I think in this day and age, the one, I mean, you know, there were pros and cons of the digital age, but I think one of the cons of the digital age is people want satisfaction here and now. You know, they want immediate happiness, immediate satisfaction, immediate gratification for whatever they're experiencing. And that doesn't lend itself to long-term planning and having a vision. And during construction of something is, you know, really painful. And and sometimes you, you cause people enormous inconvenience. But to sit on your hands and do nothing isn't an option as far as I'm concerned. And I'd much rather be criticised for having a vision and implementing it um, than, than not. And um, I'm proud of what our government's achieved. I'm proud of, I hope, what people will say when they look back on this period in our state's history. And, and do you know what? I, I think that's a really profound point, yeah. it, it is to have the perspective, the courage and the, the sort of the fortitude to say, you know, in 60 years' time, people might look back and go, bloody hell, I'm glad he or she did that, yeah. rather than, yeah. oh gosh, the Twitter trolls are going to say X, Y, yeah. and Z, and who cares? You know. Yeah, and I remember, I think every major project we've announced or that I've been involved with has attracted controversy. There isn't a single project... Uh, that that we've announced that hasn't at the obviously people want something to happen and then when you when you actually do it they're concerned about what it means for them and the impact and that is often a difficult thing to deal with because you don't you think to yourself how would I feel if I lived by the side of a road that was getting rebuilt or if I lived on a train you know a train line underneath my house and I'll be having a tunnel going underneath my house and it doesn't bother me at all because I've seen how expert uh, modern day construction is but um, and I think as a community. Um, we, we can look forward to having better options, and but that involves building things and doing things. And interestingly, that same bridge that you spoke about in Northbridge used to have trams going across it. Wow. So it had light rail, yeah. which they ripped out. I've got a photo of, um, of, of the tram going through North, going to Northbridge. But um, at the end of the day, it's about improving the quality of life of our citizens. And I can't imagine not doing it. I mean, to stagnate, to fall behind, to be reliant on the car is not the way we want to be. I, I am I'm a pom, obviously, yeah. from my accent, and uh, I remember uh, the process of the Channel Tunnel. Really interesting. Where, where on a, a sort of a macro historical level, you go, well, of course, it's a great idea. I mm. mean, come on, and now mm. it exists, and you can yeah. whiz in a train from London to Paris for lunch. It's, I mean, it, you know, yeah. you, you'd be hard pressed to meet anyone who goes, I wish we didn't have it. It's fantastic. Oh my lord! At the time. You know, so and so's garden's going to be disrupted, and 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 you get it. But you go, well, are we going to ever do anything? And mm. if we are, hey, you know, progress takes hard work and change. No, exactly. Wonderful. Well, we're going to move on to your possession. It's a bit of a royal groupie. Yeah. Uh, you've chosen a photo, a selfie of you and uh, Harry and Meghan. Were they oh, nice? They were lovely. Very lovely. Um, very lovely, down to earth. Um, and uh, was wonderful to welcome them to to New South Wales. 
But yeah, I just, in general, I love photographs. They capture a time and place and uh, capture history. And um, it's pretty amazing that um, you can kind of look at, you know, when you think about key moments in your life, you kind of see, fl- you know, flickers of images going through your head. And I think photographs are kind of the manifestation of that, aren't they? And, and are you a silver frame type person or do you just keep them on in the cloud or? No, I don't. I, d- I tend not to frame things like that. No. You know, I reckon they're going to come back into fashion. I used to be ardently, I used to be, because I'm quite organised, um, obsessive almost, I used to be very assiduous in my photo albums. Ah, alphabetical S- or um, chronological? Subject. Or- <laughs> so I used to have a high school. I had high school, then I had friends, and then I had my godchildren. <laughs> me sad, yeah, me happy. Not quite that much, but I, I, the physical photo album I had chronicled and, and put in order. But then as soon as the digital stuff started happening, I've kind of fall. I'm not very good at that. My sis, One of my sisters is exceptional at it, so she kind of is a family historian now. But um, I just take things I like and people send me things and I save them, but I'm not very organised on right. the digital side. Yeah, But the photo, you know, when it was hardcore... Um, photo albums, I was very organised. Right. I, I, I love the notion of, I mean, and it drives my, my daughters in particular mad, I'll, I'll take one picture. Just like the picture I've taken with you, I get one, I, I went, you know, well, that wasn't a good yeah. one of me, just take one. Yeah. But then when I scroll through retrospectively, especially of my family, with pictures that have got all my family and I've got four kids, I love choosing one and then saying, right, that one, mm. frame it. Mm. Right, just a small frame, mm. yeah, and then that and that will stand out. Yeah. That, that will be on yeah. the top of the the bookshelf, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, I've got a few ones like I've got a few that I've framed, mainly of my family. A few, a few that I like. Um, yeah, but I don't have a lot of them around. There. And is it true you have six godchildren? Yeah, or it is. Six. Right. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so there's, yeah. there's sort of a, there's a little bit of a. Uh, um, you've got to have a few pictures of them. Oh, I do, but I in an album and on my phone, I don't have a lot. As I said, I don't. Apart from my immediate family, I don't have a lot of photos around the house. Right. Because I also am someone who doesn't like to offend, and I think you know. Ah. I think of my friends, and I've got lots of close friends, and you just worry. I, mean, I do worry about offending people, so I don't well, like because to. you you haven't. They're not equally yeah, represented. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think if I stick to my parents and my sisters, it's safe ground. So, so, so <laughs> my, my, my mother in law, who is gorgeous and I love dearly, yeah. has a. I mean, lives in England, yeah. has a grand piano, yeah. and my wife has three sisters who are all married, yeah. and there are lots and lots of pictures of their very impressive husbands. And there isn't one of me. See, <laughs> the fact that you even know that story says that you're slightly jarred by it. Uh, not slightly See, jarred, I'm crushed. See, and I can imagine if someone walks into your home and sees all these photos and where am I and why aren't I here? So I, I think about stuff like that. I don't like anyone being hurt unnecessarily or... Well, aren't you or, sweet? Yeah, no, it's just not really. It's just, oh. I think it's a normal human condition, but I don't like, for me, reducing the hurt anybody feels is really important. So, oh. yeah. Well, there is a traditional six question. Ah. Which is, mm. um, who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next? Oh, great question. Who would I like to hear from? Probably Zuckerberg. Right. I don't know much about him personally, but I would want his honest views of the world on um, what he's done and the impact he's had and whether he thinks it's the right thing and the right direction. Mm. I'll get on the phone to him this afternoon. Gladys Berger, you've been a real angel. Thank oh, you thank so you. much You're very for coming kind. in. You've been very gentle and I appreciate it. I don't often get treated like this, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure. <laughs> the Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 